<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. The phone is a little bit off angle and I'm nervous about fixing it. If you just turn your head a little bit to the side like you're nodding off, maybe that'll straighten it out. It's not too bad. But I don't like it being off kilter. So I want to bring you over to our map because it's a reference point and today the Galilee map with the book of Ezekiel and his prophecy about the prince of Tyre. So Tyre is a very special, has a lot of mentions in the Bible. I'm not sure if the first time is when the king of Tyre sends the cedars of Lebanon to build the to build the um, uh, the temple in Jerusalem for Solomon. And actually, our boat altar here inside is made of is built from cedars of Lebanon because those were used to build a place for worship of God. And here we have that connection in our boat altar. Good morning. Enjoy the sunrise. So there's the family. The families are staying here at the moment. Besides our other guests from the kibbutz. So I'm heading over here to the map for you. So in the case of today's reading, there isn't jubilation over the, the Prince of Tyre. Tyre is a little peninsula up on the Lebanese coast. Oh, there's a good spot to see this right now. Let's get a little height here. So if we look between the buildings here, between the northern wing of the guest house and the restaurant still to be built, we can see this hill behind Migdal. And then in the distance, Faintly, we can see those hills separating Lebanon and Israel, an area that needs much prayer for peace. And all the farmers who live in that area are both sides of the border are experiencing a lot of disruption of their lives with all this conflict. I don't think we ever captured that window reflecting the sun. That's the window into the chapel of the daughter of Jairus. Right here in this spot here. The mosaic presentation. So here we are at the at this map. And then we have here on the opposite side from where we're standing right now, we have Phoenicia, the Phoenicians, and then Tyre and Sidon. So the king of Tyre. And then we also had the Syrophoenician woman who's asked Jesus to let the crumbs fall from the, the table. Such a beautiful, uh, humble faith request. Okay, the sun isn't up enough yet, so I thought I'd catch the sun here. The sun is kind of <laughs> an important anchor in our little experience every day, isn't it? The sunrise stroll and chat. So we have two major contrasting stories today. The Ezekiel one with this 
arrogant leader, economic genius, success story, who declares himself and expresses himself as divine because he feels so secure in his power. And he is able to withstand the Assyrians, but actually he falls to the Babylonians. Another case to show how human arrogance doesn't go very far. It causes a lot of suffering and damage. It can express itself in very high sounding power. But actually, it spells a lot of trouble even for the arrogant person, because it's not truth. It's, it's fantasy, it's, it's just impression, noise. Empty, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. As a farming boy, I heard that line on the first Sunday of August in 1974, 50 years ago. And it was another day that was confirming my path, having finished high school and heading for the, or maturing in the awareness and decision of following this path of life, for which I'm very grateful. And that really takes us into the gospel that Peter asks, what's the story with us who have left everything for you? So you have one person plundering and building up treasures of silver and gold and you have other people leaving their treasure, their homes, their farms, their family, their material assets. Interesting how, how God can ask us to leave everything for him, for his mission. millions have followed that call over the centuries and meanwhile millennia we were talking the other day about Max Kolbe this Polish fellow he built up a monastery with 800 people and then today we're celebrating St. Bernard and the monastery he joined was dying. There were just a handful of very elderly monks. And he was young and all his siblings joined and before he died, there were 70 monasteries founded from his work. Imagine the count. Uh, there's a scholar here of the Byzantine archaeology uh, in Israel. Uh, he's a good friend and he's very involved with the dig in Bethsaida. Maybe you met him there already. Sometimes he spoke on the live streams. And he developed a map of all the... I'm not sure if he's the only one who developed it. Probably others also, obviously. Because he's a new PhD in the field. And there were over 600 monastic ruins across 
just the territory of Israel today, from the Byzantine period. I'm just doing a little compute because the majority of those would be monasteries, communities of consecrated people. And the over 2,000 years, all who have followed. And then it's not just the following in the consecrated life, uh, physically following like this, but those who follow in their heart as they live their responsibilities without attachment to material things, living true chastity, living the, the great gift of also evangelical obedience. And many, many people live in that virtuous way, countless people. You know, sometimes the impressions of a world and decadence dominates and there's no question about an incredible amount of decadence in different periods of history. But uh, the tent population here is growing apparently. So we leave them to have their peace. They have a lot of lights up celebrating. So it's a nice environment for families, for children, magical environment for them to be sleeping outdoors in their tents. The joys of summer experience. New experience of family. Also living in a tent is interesting because you no longer have your own bedroom, your own bed. You might have some, some mosquitoes visiting. You might hear the coyotes not far away. Dad might check that there are no snakes around. That experience of precariousness is also an education for our children and a process of understanding that unlike the king of Tyre, we truly are dependent on the gift of life. Nature is such a teacher of, of truth and a path to enter into the mystery of God. Learning to share a different use of space. To adjust to needs of others. The challenge of brushing teeth and restroom facilities and these type of situations are public and shared. All of that, what an education for our children, a discovery, and then the treasuring their own home when they get back to it with a new sense of gratitude. The exact opposite of arrogance tasting the joys of oh, something jumped there in the water tasting the joys of of all the good things that we have There's a line in here in the psalm, which is actually a canticle from Deuteronomy. Our own hand won the victory. The Lord had nothing to do with it. It's a quotation. And then the comment is, for they are a people devoid of reason, having no understanding. It was a famous line my dad often quoted is that by his own power the hawk flies.
Imagine the disciples here receiving that call to leave everything and follow. And the king of Tyre is grasping everything and losing it all. And these guys are leaving everything. and receiving a hundredfold and eternal life. The Sea of Galilee. This is one of the great, the joys for me of the Sea of Galilee is this the place of this call, of the announcing of the kingdom. And how it enters into our own lives. Sorry, there was a little cut there. Um, that's because when I came back by the this uh, lake house, it triggered the Wi-Fi into action again, and then it wasn't sustained, so it got a lapse. People, we leave it like that for today. God bless you. See you later, alligators. Be blessed today. Let's, let's uh, ponder the meaning of life, the meaning of our possessions, the opportunity they give us, and the gratitude we owe our Creator. And then the call.